We finally come to episode twelve, which coincides with the conclusion of volume one of the original light novel. I think it might look a little bit confusing at the very start when Mama was asking around. It actually didn't specifically mention what she was asking around. She wasn't really asking for everyone to help. It's more asking what's gonna happen. Like she essentially wanted to know more about whether she herself is gonna be included on the people who are being discharged after the execution at the end of the last episode. Since they didn't explicitly say that, it might give off the impression that she's asking for help from everybody. Which, interestingly enough, that thought didn't come across her head at this point yet. And if anything, by any logical sense, if she actually asked for help from anyone inside the Rear Palace, they would have helped her. But that's not how storytelling works, and that's not how story setup works. So we're gonna have this whole story arc moving forward. What's also interesting to notice, if you look at the back, there are door nails on each of the large scale doors. They, after all, once again modeled this after the Forbidden City. However, the number of door nails are wrong. The door nails on the doors of Forbidden City have a specific number. They're not put on by random, and they're not there just to fill a space randomly. Each single side of the door in the Forbidden City will have nine rows and nine columns of door nails, making each door having eighty-one nails. The reason why is nine was considered the highest single-digit number. And each side of the door will have nine times nine door nails to symbolize how high a position the emperor is, and that's very specific. They don't have any missing nails on the doors. Whereas in this show, it's eight by ten or eight by eleven, which means they probably seen the door, but they didn't really get the idea behind the number of door nails. If you consider Mama's circumstances, given the amount of things that have happened, if she really didn't want to be fired, she could have just asked. The rear palace in ancient China was strict, yes, and for many cases inhumane by modern standard. But they were still run by people, and they're far from unreasonable. If somebody was framed, given like her circumstances, she was kidnapped and sold under a pretended background. If something was like this, they'd fully understand that, and they wouldn't punish you irregardless of your circumstances. Especially when you have at least two, maybe even three, of the highest concubine in the rear palace vouching for you. If you ask, but since I guess she didn't ask, and they shouldn't say anything if you didn't ask for it, so we're gonna see her going back to where she came from. I mean, in particular, Gokuyo could have interfered herself, given how she has the most interaction with Mao Mao in general. But something tells me once again that she's the kind of person that actually wanted entertainment. And she knows fully well that Jinxi wants to get her back as much as possible. She didn't really feel like she should be the one intervening, and she kind of wants him to intervene instead. Then after she went back to the red light district, essentially, she started working in the brothel that she kind of grew up in. And here we're gonna have to talk a little bit more about how brothels usually run in ancient China. As I mentioned a few episodes ago, they were subdivided into classes. Officially, there were three levels of subclasses, and you have your first rank, and second rank, and third rank brothels. Generally, the first and second ranks would be equivalent to your high-level clubs nowadays. Where entry would have been exclusive, it would have been very expensive for you to go, and you generally need an introduction. You don't march in with just like a bag of money with a money sign on it. That generally didn't work. And second class usually would have been more flexible, but they were comparatively still costly. Generally, third class will be mid to low rank class, and then there were ones below these classes that weren't really in the official classification, which would have been run on a lower scale, generally with less service. Those would have been places where you go specifically just for sexual relief. 
The higher ones generally will offer way more service. Every single one of the three officially classed classes would have a whole set of support staff and support mechanisms. Each one would at least have a kitchen. They had kitchen staff in all of them. They also had male servants acting as both security guards and servants and waiters. The two higher ones will offer anything from music performances to stage shows to operas and everything in between. And generally, you have a few ways of approaching this. You either go, or if you're rich enough, you might actually invite people from this particular house into your house for performance. Now, because the red light district is pretty interchangeable with entertainment district, all entertainers, your stage performers, your drama actors, your opera singers, would have commingled with essentially courtesans and prostitutes, and there is really not. Much distinction in between these two careers. You could easily jump from one to the other, so they would have been invited into parties, and that's what we're seeing right now in this show. That they actually are invited into their houses, and because they're going into this person's house, they charge extra. Depends essentially takeout service. And we're introduced with the three head courtesans of the Vergris house, which Mama grew up in. If you look at them individually, then you see that they're actually wearing pretty traditional makeup of Tang Dynasty and onward, which subsequently did influence Japanese makeup for Japanese geisha and、uh, noble women. Since in terms of Chinese influence on Japan, the highest was probably the Tang Dynasty. Namely, the eyebrow above eyebrow, and also the mark on the forehead. Those were pretty typical makeups of that period. Some of them would be on the cheek as well, but usually the forehead was more common. And then we get to see this house of the individual. It has a full garden, has two stories, has an inner hall with triple or more doorways, and their own servant. Something tells me this is no ordinary high-ranking individual. You can be a high-ranking official in imperial court in ancient China, and they'd pay you well enough, but usually not this well. You'd have to be someone from nobility, from a prominent family, and probably had titles other than your official position. Because here's the thing about ancient China. China. Generally, the whole country was run by a large number of bureaucrats that were divided into ranks, as we talked about before. Your ranks, your ranks will determine your wage. However, even for first rank officials, you generally wouldn't be getting too much. You'd be better off than everyone else, but it won't be in any scale close to what emperor would have been getting. In order for you to get more out of this, you'd have to receive extra titles that are not related to your actual bureaucratic rank, which would have been a nobleman title. Once you are nobility, then nobles generally will receive some other income, usually in the form of tax. Income from certain area or equivalent of tax income from certain area, either a village or a town or county or even like a province. Usually not a province because province usually were too big and they be given too much wealth. But if you imagine a tax income of an entire city, that's not insignificant. So you'd have first rank officials that had no noble title, which would have been living okay, but just okay. But compared to say, if a first rank official that had noble title added onto them, and these kind of noble titles could have been given as rewards as well, they wouldn't be just purely inherited. Then they would have been living much better off. And there's also a limit on how big your house would have been allowed to be. Generally, even if you were first rank officials, your house wasn't supposed to be second floor or above. And we've seen higher floors than that over here, basically suggesting that this is a nobleman's house. And when they started performing, it's actually quite typical of a performance you get from courtesans. They generally didn't only sell their body for money. A lot of them were very talented at other things: dances, singing, performing musical instrument. In this case, an arhu, which was a pretty typical Chinese musical instrument you see during Chinese New Year and so on. And you see courtesans playing go with customers, and that would have been another service. You play some like game, 
Because a lot of these people that go to these kind of very high-end brothels were pretty rich and powerful, and if anything, well-educated people, and they didn't really just go there specifically for you know. So it would have been more complex than just that. Here's the thing with when Mao Mao and Jin Shi met again. If anything, it feels like the anime actually did this scene very underwhelmingly, because compared to the scene inside the light novel. And the two versions of manga adaptation of the light novel, the backdrop and the general color tone of the anime is a little bit too dark. It didn't really stand out. It's a pretty sentimental moment, but the way they've done it, it just feels a little bit underwhelming compared to the other one. They were never in one scene together. You don't see their reaction and face in the same scene. It's one and then the other. So that's just a little bit underwhelming, and we get our classic misunderstanding arc where each person thought the other person probably didn't want any of this and assumed otherwise, and that's easily resolved. Just talk, and then we found out this is a setup essentially. And if anything, I assume this is Gao Shen's place, which just further proves that Jin Shi is most likely, at least officially, known as the Emperor's brother. Now we found out last episode that he may as well just be the emperor's firstborn son, but then again, probably officially still known as the emperor's brother. Because if you consider this is Gao Shen's place and he serves Jin Shi, and if his place is this nice and he still serves the other guy, it means that he's no low-ranking official or even mid-ranking official. He's probably one of those high-ranking officials with a nobleman title. And if he's serving someone, then that person must be much higher in terms of hierarchy. So who else is it gonna be? And then we have this interesting flower pot of four different flowers actually inside the pot. Quite a nice symbolism for the three head courtesans and Mao Mao. If you take a look, the flower on the bottom left corner that's actually plum blossom. A lot of the ladies in this show are named after a flower or a plant, and one of them's name was Mei Mei, which is literally just plum flower. And we see plum flower in the bottom left corner. And then on the upper left corner, we see a whole bunch of what I assume is magnolia, which magnolia didn't really tie in with anyone's name, but specifically this is a white magnolia, and Pyrin's name contained white in it, so that's her. And the other lady is just whatever that's on the right side, which is a、uh, chrysanthemum. Something tells me that she might be nobility just by the kind of flower that they are using, because chrysanthemum usually was associated with nobility and noble family as well. And she seemed mysterious enough and well mannered enough. As I was mentioning, some of the sources for courtesans and prostitutes back then would have been people who were sold to prostitution because of punishment of one of the family members extended to them. And as a part of nobility, if one of your family members committed a serious enough crime, that might happen to you. And we know the least about her because she barely spoke. So I'd assume that she might be nobility, and then at the very center we've seen the flower that symbolizes Mao Mao, which is cat's claw or cat's foot plant that I actually talk about in the first episode all the way back. It's right at the center, surrounded by all these three flowers. If you remember the way that the madam actually sent them off, she basically said that earn as much as possible. That would have been a typical attitude of people usually working in these red light districts and、uh, courtesan houses. Mainly that they would have been following the mantra of get rich or die trying, because that's a kind of job with a relatively short lifespan by comparison, and they usually would have been looked down by society. So generally, they've all essentially adapted this kind of mentality and mantra. Hence, the reason why, even though they seem like close enough family members, they still want to get Mao Mao into prostitution because they probably thought it wasn't as bad as it's made out to be. But、uh, we know that this show probably wouldn't be able to go on with her being outside of the Rear Palace. So we're gonna have to get her back, which Jin Shi promptly did. If you think about his position, probably would have been easy for him. 
And then what he gave her is actually a cordyceps. You guys might remember that as a plant that turned people into zombies. Well, in reality, cordyceps was a very rare kind of fungus that actually grew on caterpillars. And once they've grown enough, due to the fact that they are a parasitic fungus, they will sprout on the head of the caterpillar, killing the caterpillar and grow into a fungus. Generally because the fruiting body is very thin and straight, it looks like a grass blade. So people thought it was a plant. In reality, cordyceps didn't really have the effect of turning people into zombies. Even though it is a parasitic fungus, it's only parasitic to caterpillars. Unless if you have the same genetic makeup of a caterpillar, then you usually don't have to worry. Mainly because human anatomy would have been way different from a caterpillar. So you usually wouldn't have to worry about these kind of things having the same effect as they would on another life form like this. We don't have any cordyceps fungus that turns people into walking zombies, for sure. Would there be one that might be parasitic on humans? We're not sure, but we haven't found any yet. And even if they were parasitic on humans, they wouldn't behave the way that they behaved, like turning people into zombies. So generally, these kind of cordyceps fungus would have been very rare, and they were used in traditional Chinese medicine. Although, unlike some traditional Chinese medicine, which had more well-documented effect under analysis of essentially modern science and uh, pharmacology analysis, the effect of cordyceps is dubious and uh, inconclusive at best. And some studies even shown that wild ones might take up too much arsenic. Irregardless of that, these were very rare, and they were seen as a rare ingredient for herbal medicine. So because of how rare they were and how rare they still are, it's easy to understand that Jinxi can easily bribe Mao Mao into coming back by using this. Of course, he just paid the madam with gold, and that would have been more than enough. If anything, if Jinxi really is the emperor's brother, he probably doesn't have an exact concept of money. Not to say that he has no concept of money. Being the manager of Rear Palace, you kind of have to have some concept of money. In terms of how much one should spend on each thing, if it's not related to the Rear Palace, he probably has no idea. If you grew up in an imperial palace, you don't need to earn your money. So how would you know if something's expensive or cheap? How would you know if something's overpriced or not? You generally wouldn't. And that just basically says enough about him. Now, up to this point, we are done with the storyline of Volume 1 of the light novel. Basically wrapping things up over here. And then, since the anime didn't stop here, they are going to animate what I assume is the entirety of second volume of the light novel. Because interestingly enough, volumes usually end with a chapter that wraps things up pretty well. So it's a good cutoff point. Even though we'd have many, many more stories to come. If I remember correctly, this is on volume 14 or 15 in terms of light novel production. And since we're only getting through one volume with one quarter of animation, we most likely won't get the full story fully animated. Generally because it hasn't stopped serializing as a light novel yet. So the story isn't over yet, and if we were to animate everything, then if one volume takes one season to animate, then we need 20 or something seasons, which is like 6-7 years continuously in order to finish this whole work, and that's generally not something you get from any adaptation. But two volumes would have been a pretty good wrap-up point. It would have been a complete enough story in terms of storytelling. Not the kind of ending that we'd want or expect, but as a cutoff point, until otherwise unknown period of time where this might get continued, then that's not too bad. So we're gonna get into the next episodes right away. Things will pick up from here. Usually the first volume was to set things up, even though we had a lot of things going on here. Next volume generally will be dealing with more of what's going on. Either dealing with the rare palace or even just imperial court in general we would have been given more detail about each aspect of life in the imperial palace. So there's more to come.